Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the terms that Yeshua uses a lot is it's related to the term shalom, which doesn't just mean peace, it means completion and wholeness. Uh, and it has to do with how you deal with the heart. That's purification and the unification of the heart and the mind and the soul. Uh, the word is shalem. <clears throat> to be shalem is to be spiritually whole, complete, to achieve the restoration and return to the, the inner pardes, the tikkun, the hyros gamos, the marriage of heaven and earth, the alchemical wedding, the union of the soul with Baranash, the union of Yahi and Yahida. This is a term that's used to describe uh, reunion and union at the highest level, spiritual union. Shalom, which is related to the same root, is the peace of Ha'olam. It's the peace of God which passeth understanding. Uh, there is halakha to overcome duality that Yeshua prescribes. He says, and his cure for that, his remedy is compassion. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Forgive those who abuse you. Now, we have to understand what that means because it doesn't mean what you think it might mean. It doesn't mean when a mass murderer comes through town, you go out and give him kisses. Uh, and other halakha he prescribes is non-attachment non-attachment to your possessions. The value is with the treasure in heaven, not the earthly wealth. The treasure in heaven that we've talked about that accumulates in the heart. And also to do work without attachment to reward or results. Uh, and we have parables that tell us about that. Uh, and to take joy in the happiness of others. It's better to give than to receive. Parents take joy in the happiness of their children, and they like to play Santa Claus and give them things. And then the kids grow up to be ungrateful wretches. <laughs> and his teaching about, is always, all his teachings in prayer are about, is always prayed as we, and our Father, grant us today, not my Father in heaven, grant me my daily bread, and, and all this sort of thing. So, the Shalem teachings we find in the Gospels are some of these. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then the light within you is darkness. If the light and darkness within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? To be Shalem is to make your eye single. And we'll look again at what that means. From the Gospel of Thomas, we have Shalem teachings like uh, if one is shalem, one will be filled with light, but if one is divided, one will be filled with darkness. We have to look a little more closely at what that means, to be filled with light and darkness. When you make the two into one, when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make the male and female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, nor the female be female, when you make the single eye, make a single eye in place of eyes, uh, it, in Thomas's Gospel, it says when you make eyes in place of an eye, but that's that's not that's not having been transmitted correctly. A new hand in place of a hand, a new foot in place of a foot, a new image, which is the restored tree, in place of the old image, which is the fallen tree, the fallen image. Then you will enter the Malkuth. He says, if two make peace with each other in a single house, they will say to the mountain, "Move from here," and it will move. Well, we have to, under to understand how one does this in the heart. We have to understand the, the whole Kabbalistic idea of the good and evil Yetzirin, the images, the image of God, and how the good and evil Yetzirin came into being. The Yetzir HaTov, the good Yetzir, the good image, or the good impulse, the word Yetzir can mean impulse. Man is created in the impulse of God, or the image of God. The good impulse is rooted in the seven spirits, the sephiroth, or intelligence, or senses of the divine image of the soul, plus an eighth. And uh, we'll go more into that in a minute, but the seven spirits plus an eighth are the powers of the divine image. And here I'm using, uh, this is taken from the Testament of Reuben, which is written just a few generations before the time of Yeshua. Uh, 
I'm replacing, I'm adding a couple of little things in here so that we can make them correspond. I've used a, a chakra image and now I'm, I'm having to make it into a Kabbalistic Jewish Yetzer image. So I've added things a little bit to change them. Uh, this is the tree. This is the unfallen tree. Uh, here we have at the very height, at the very above, at the eighth level, is what we might call manda or gnosis or knowledge. Then we have what is a life seed. It's called the uh, ruach of life. But the, the word life is hayim, as I think Daniel pointed out, it says lives, but it's, it's the root of everything. Everything comes through keter down to the other sephiro. Sight is an organ that is related to, uh, that, that is generated from this. This is where hearing is located, on the ears, smell, and nose, <coughs> taste in, at the mouth. Speech is located with the throat, and uh, love is located <coughs> with the heart, and this is it. You know, we don't have chakras down in the lower parts of the body. These are the primordial chakras. We don't have the others shown as chakras because these are not really chakras. These are the seven spirits with a plus an eight. So there is no Yetzir Hara or evil impulse in the divine image or tree. As a matter of fact, these eight images could be portrayed in the face and then one above the face. And that would be like the uh, Macroprosopus. The Kabbalists did long dissertations on each part of each hair of the beard of the grat of the vast face. The universe was so vast and all this sort of thing. But these are now expanded from the face down to the heart level, the way I'm showing them. And Plato, for example, says the soul begins as a sphere, as your head, as your face, and then all the rest of the things sort of come out from that which is maybe not really the way it is in terms of physical generation, but that was his idea of how the souls were incarnated. Well, here in the, the, the Jewish concept uh, that we have here, in the unfallen tree, this is what there is of you. There is no lower body, so to speak. There are no lower functions. You have no need to excrete you, and all this sort of thing. These are, the, these are the divine powers that are in your image. Uh, when you're given a coat of skin, when you become incarnate uh, and driven out of Eden, that is into the incarnate world of physical flesh, the spirit or the sephiro prolapse and they associate with organs like the stomach and the liver, things like that. So this is what we call a prolapse tree, the fallen tree. This is the incarnated tree. This is what we, we look like where we are right now. The Yetzerim Ha-Ra, and so we're talking about the, the seven plus one evil spirits, so to speak, attach like vampiric clipot or shards or husks of negative inverted energy rooted in the mortal nature of flesh to these, uh, these spirits uh, to influence and twist how they express, how the Spirit of God expresses. Up in here, that spirit, which is a spirit that will give you divine revelation from the Yetzer Hara, or the Yetzer Hato, the good Yetzer, can also give you the spirit of fantasy and illusion. Uh, this spirit of, of life, which is the life force, is actually the root of your whole sense of justice and what is right and what is righteous. <coughs> when it's twisted, I'm putting it in the red over here. It gives you, it, it, it causes you to, uh, to send out injustice into the world. And it's like a covering that does that, filters this. Uh, when you are operating with the, the, the divine nature, the divine image that God has placed in you and that gives you life to begin with, uh, your eyes, your eyes are two eyes like this, and they are the root of what would eventually develop as the single eye, clairvoyant, psychic sight, 
but they are also the root as the Yetzir, the Yetzir HaTov of deceit and deception. That's where it is rooted in your, in your body. And the throat chakra, what we call a throat chakra, is a chakra that gives you action and it's especially made for spiritual teaching. It's for you to express the Dharma, to express the spiritual teaching. But when it is uh, influenced and twisted by the Yetzir Ra, it becomes uh, distorted into pride, the sense that one is better. That very often, uh, spiritual teachers I have a sense that they are better than other people and they're part of their spiritual teaching. And that's part of this thing that Yeshua did not like that is translated as hypocrisy, but it really means uh, taking nose at, which means uh, not related to the throat, but it means turning the nose up at other people, feeling superior to other people. It's pride, spiritual pride. Um, and then in the heart uh, is the is where the spirit of discrimination, your bullshit meter, is there. That's where you're going to feel and know and sense what's right and what's wrong, what's true, what's not true. But if you, the way that the evil spirit distracts you from being able to make that distinction is through inattention. When you don't focus, you don't concentrate your attention. Now what we were doing here with the heart math is we were focusing our attention on our heart. When we're focusing our attention on our heart and breathing in our heart, we are also physiologically balancing our, uh, our nervous system. We're balancing our, uh, our voluntary and involuntary nervous system so that we have, uh, that we're most totally reactive to what we can do. We're, we're in touch with what's real. You see, your heart beat is not steady, it's not a steady 60 all the time, except if you're like me and you're drugged, so that it will do that. But your heartbeat goes faster and goes slower. It's, it's constantly adjusting to the environment and things around, speeds up, slows down. And when it's in coherence, it slows, speeds up, slows down like a sine wave, and a sinusoidal way, and that means you are totally on the alert. You are totally ready to receive and understand and do things like that and so that you are uh, ready to be physically alert, you're ready to be mentally alert, uh, and spiritually alert. <coughs> and it makes it, it makes it very possible for you to experience bliss and things like this and certain kinds of forms of meditation. But if you are inattentive, if you are not focused in your heart, if you don't pay any attention to what the heart is doing, uh, then you lose the ability to make those discriminations. You become less and less sensitive to those things. Now, I don't think that because I'm taking drugs, I'm less sensitive to those things, but I don't think it, I can show it physiologically very well uh, with uh, what we have. So I practice it. I practice the heart math, and I practice making the coherence happen in spite of the drugs. So that's one of the things I have to do. Now, the what we think of as the solar plexus area is where the ancient Kabbalists located in human flesh the power to manifest things through the solar plexus. It was the divine power to manifest. And if you work with solar plexus and throat chakra together uh, through, you can do it through mantra, you can do it through other kinds of things, you can actually do it through speaking and other kinds of things. You can manifest and bring things into reality. Uh, you can make something real. You can manifest this and you can manifest good and evil fruits and things like that. But uh, if you are obscured by the, the Yetzir Hara, that gives you aggression. That makes you an aggressive person. It makes you a high testosterone type A or something like that, you know, and, and it will uh, disturb your ability to manifest you will undo your ability to make manifestation. Uh, down in your hara, your navel, uh, your genital, your generative area, is where nourishment is provided to your body. It's your vital force, the actual thing that nourishes you 
in a, in a psychic and spiritual way it doesn't come through your mouth, it doesn't come through your stomach, it actually comes through your generative center. And when that is uh, abused and when the energy is not used properly, then it becomes gluttony, which is a sort of, so to speak, a sin. It's trying, it's trying to take too much into yourself, to possess too much, to take all the food for yourself type of thing. And finally, at the root chakra is where is located the spirit of chesed, love. And that's very basic and root for everything, and we'll talk about what love is in, in, in a while. But when it's abused, and it's, when, it's, uh, when the wrong impulse, the impulse that has become parasitic to this, is followed, then it turns into lust, and that's a very simple, easy simplification of all the sort of things. So you have the good Yetzer and the evil Yetzer. The good Yetzer are Yetzerim, it's seven plus one, eight, in the scheme of things. And the evil Yetzer are parasitic to the good Yetzer, you're, so to speak, possessed by it, or obsessed by it. And your job is to eventually exercise yourself of all this. And the, this transformation is something you make by consciously becoming aware of what is motivating you, what are your motives, why are you wanting to do things. And looking within your heart at your motives, when you look within your heart, the heart is the center of action for all of this. The heart is the brain for this whole system. Now when we look at the term of shalem, which is the purification of the heart and mind and the soul, making the two into one does not mean balancing the good and evil impulses. Where you say, well, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do a little good and we'll do a little bad. Something like that. It doesn't mean ignoring the bad impulses. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pretend they don't exist. I don't even see it, you know. Uh, the old Desert Fathers said, of a great saint that uh, he never allowed uh, anger to rise any higher than his throat. He didn't know he was angry until you start to feel it in the throat. And then you have a choice. You can go ahead and express it, uh, and, uh, or if you're just a little boy, at least you use your words instead of your fists. But the throat is the seat of that kind of action and manifestation as well. So that's bad, because now you're expressing what comes out of you is bad. It's, you're defiling yourself with it. You're causing the negative in you to grow. But if it comes up to your throat and you recognize it, you're not, uh, you're not suppressing it so that you don't recognize you're angry, but you know you're angry, but you choose consciously to uh, not repress it, but to maybe to push it back down, so to speak. He doesn't allow, allow anger to rise higher than his throat. Then you control your anger and you get control of yourself, and that is how you, uh, the good Yetzer gains dominance over the evil Yetzer, so to speak. Another thing that is said in the Gospel of Thomas, as Yeshua says, is, uh, Cursed is the man whom the lion eats, and the lion will become man, but blessed is uh, the lion whom the man eats, and Oh, let's see, how does it go? Cursed is the uh, man whom the lion eats, and the man will become a lion. But blessed is the lion whom the man eats, and the lion will become a man. And that means, if we compare lion to the devil, which it's often compared to, or the anger or fury of the devil, or to aggression or to anger, if you swallow your anger and you control it, then you humanize yourself. If you let your anger to consume you and control you, then you turn yourself into an angry lion. You're turning yourself into a beast. So this is what's meant. You don't ignore the bad impulses. If you, if you can't feel your feelings, you're in a bad tr trouble. You've got to get so you can feel what you feel. If you're not paying attention in your heart, you won't be able to. And then you don't balance them either. You don't balance the good and evil. That's not what you do, the negative and the positive. It means you achieve an interior marriage of heaven and earth in your heart 
And that means first you do a purification. That means you have to uh, burn up and do away with the bad stuff, the garbage. You remove or you exorcise the negative impulse from each of your senses. Now in Yeshua's moral world, there's, there, everything is black and white. There are no shades of gray. There's no ambivalence. Ambivalence is a bad thing, to be ambivalent. You have to choose. It has to be black or white. Now, black and white can be very close in shades. It can be a very hard distinction to make. And the more advanced you get spiritually, the more difficult and the more subtle the, the choices you are have to make. But you have to make the choice. You can't let it go ambivalent. You can't let it go balancing the good and evil impulses. You have to... You have to Figure out what the bad stuff is and you have to exercise it. You have to get rid of it. You have to transform it. You have to kill the demon. And this is done through the discrimination of the heart. And that's why the heart is so important. You have to be aware in your heart. Because the dark forces can exist only where there's no light. Where they're not known. They exist by ignorance. And negative impulses can't survive scrutiny. They exist simply because of intention, ignorance, and ambivalence. So Yeshua says to Satan, get thee behind me. I have found you out. I've seen where you are. Now, get back there where you belong behind me. But if Satan is behind you, you don't know he's back there, and you don't look around to see that he is, that's a whole different thing. But putting the evil behind you means putting it in, take the second priority, go away. So... The dark forces exist because of inattention and ignorance and ambivalence. So when you do your, your necklace practice, you do, uh, an evening, um, you do an evening contemplation of what ways you were hornswoggled by negative forces. And then you bind them in a little knot. And, then, and what's the way of making yourself attentive to what you're doing? And as I said before, that, that's a great technique that, that uh, Krishnamurti suggested to his followers. So Yeshua insisted upon self-examination of all motivation. Not, not just of your acts, not just the fruits of what you do, but the motivation you do. Become aware of what you're thinking, how you're reacting, what you're feeling at all times. Krishnamurti said, don't judge yourself, just observe yourself. That's all it takes because you will correct yourself if you see it, if you make yourself aware of it. That alone will root out your bad habits and your psychological addictions and so on. Uh, you have to become aware of it. The knowledge of it is what will allow you to get control. It's like a weed. When the weed is so small, you can't even get your fingers around it to pull it out. You have to let it grow, and you can see it, and you can pull it out. In fact, it's a lot easier to pull it out if you wet the soil and let it uh, get nice and wet and do that. And that's why they say you must cry and weep for your sins because it allows you to pull the weeds out of the garden. Second, there are charisms that develop as you achieve this interior marriage by this process of inner purification. They are called cities in, in other traditions. You develop the higher octave of your senses, your sephiro, your sephirotic image of God, your powers of God within you. From sight, you develop psychic sight. It comes very slowly, it comes in dreams, it comes in intuitions. From hearing you develop your ability to teach. From hearing you actually develop, that's the word in Hebrew, is to, uh, to hear and to obey. Instant obedience to spirit is what allows you to teach, to hear the spirit and then you are teaching what you are being taught. So it's from hearing that you actually develop the ability to become a spiritual teacher. From smell, you develop intuition, psychic intu intuition. A lot of this is written, by the way, in Sarah Darian's wonderful book called The Psyche and Psychism. It's an old Rosicrucian doctrine based on the teachings of Yeshua. From the taste, sense of taste, you develop the psychic sense of discrimination. You can kind of uh, tell what's going on. From speech, you develop the ability to manifest things in the world. The word eventually. God manifests things by speaking the word. And from compassion in the heart, you develop a special kind of nourishment and divine love that impregnates the hearts of others and replicates itself. It's a flame that you pass on. So the Kabbalistic 
tree of life, the Otsayim, is, is symbolized by the central column of the Kabbalistic tree. You have to fully know your fallen or prolapsed constitution and its balanced forces, that is the paths, how all these things connect before you can start working on restoring these, restoring your tree to the original divine image. So here you have, this is what the Kabbalistic medieval people were doing. You're making you totally aware of, of, of the fallen tree, so to speak. And then you lift the middle pillar back into its pre-fallen state by awareness in the heart, which is Tiferet, with prayers and practices to attune to heaven and seek you in your, uh, uh, contemplation and meditation. And that lifts up, it restores the path of your divine image for a while. And then it falls back. And in doing so, you're preparing also for your death, because this is these are practices where you practice restoring your divine image through spiritual practices and awarenesses and what you do in life. And as you can see, the paths that connect Tiferet, the heart and the fallen state, how many paths are there connecting? Eight. There are eight. How many are there in the unfallen Six. state? And look, Yeso is lifted up to here. It's got a very different kind of situation than it has here. All of a sudden, the, the sexual part is sanctified in a different way. These connections are made in a different way. Uh, yeah. Um, these charisms, you said um, Sardarian's work, psychic, psychic and psychism, is there also um, a Kabbalistic or uh, reference for this? I don't know. I don't okay. know of any. And why does why do you have any idea why speech is replaces touch? Because this was going through the five senses, and suddenly it became speech instead of touch. Um, these aren't actually. They aren't not actually the five senses. They are the uh, they're the five spirits that we're talking about. This is related to the the system of spirits on the previous page. And so that's, uh, it, it's related oh, to the throat okay. chakra and so on. Okay. Yeah, touch is more related to compassion in the heart and that sort of thing I would imagine. But uh, it's not something that's, uh, it's related in this way. You don't find it uh, in the, the, the seven spirits plus one in the, that system. Okay. And the key, the, the, the key to all of this, and it's preserved in the New Testament as being stressed, is faith, faith, faith. But what is faith? It means faithfulness, perseverance, emuna, a name. The key to all of this is you keep on keeping on, you keep on doing this. And this is how Shalem is achieved. Not something that happened really long. Here is a nice, uh, rather modern Kabbalistic uh, diagram of all the worlds viewed as condensed into one fallen tree, and then it even has uh, uh, it shows you where Da'at is, the Bat Kol, which is the the daughter of the the voice, is the contact point for the Klippel. That's also where the negative forces come into the tree. Uh, and each of the clip-off have, have different, ha, each of the sephiroth have different clip -off. For example, Lilith is the clip -off of Malkuth. There's a whole lot of Kabbalistic stuff about this. And the other thing is, this one has incorrect tarot attribu attributions on it. And I have done all the correct ones that we use just the trumps when we're doing certain kinds of work in second order, which I'll teach people more about later. So is this the corrected picture or this is not? This is the corrected picture okay. of the fallen tree yeah, with the, the attributions. And here is the corrected okay. version of the unfallen tree of where the tarot cards would have the attributions to the correct paths. And that's based on Jewish Kabbalah, not upon the Golden Dawn and different kinds of
of things like that. So on our printed sheet here, it says incorrect tarot card attributions. But you notice that there's no, the arrow's been cut off. Because on this thing, I can't print everything that's covering other things. So this, but this is actually correct. This, yeah, but that's, there's no arrow pointing here that says incorrect. I know, but this is so you might want to cross it out and say, out. put an arrow on it and say, these are the correct tarot card attributions. Most people don't have a clue as to how to use the, the Kabbalistic tarot card attributions. They come very late in the history of the tarot. Now, hub is the word that is used for sin, and it means debt or bondage to evil. It doesn't mean other things. You are asking about sin. It's like debt, like karma. It's like the Vedic idea of karma. Uh, and that's why some of the translations of the Lord's Prayer say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that's actually a pretty correct translation if you understand what debts are. They're karma. Forgive is Greek, and, and in Aramaic, it's a word meaning to release from bondage. So even in the New Testament, the word forgive is, a, is a pretty much correctly translated. It means to release, to free us from. Uh, the Egyptian heart in the court of Osiris was taken up and weighed against a feather in the court of Osiris. And if it was light, so light, there was no negative <coughs> force on it anymore. There was no weight <coughs> caused by attachment and material things and so on. Then it, the person was considered okay to pass into the, the realm of the blessed. Yeah, it's weighed against Mott's feather. Yes. Uh, Yeshua, again, I call attention to the parable of the unjust steward because your good works are friends who advocate for you in the court of God after death. And it's not on the day of judgment, but immediately after death. It's not, you know, you wait for the judgment day. So Yeshua's idea of what happens after death and, and, and so-called judgment is very different. Paul even has a, 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 a comment about that. He says that our own hearts judge us, which comes from this Egyptian idea of the heart is, is the standard. So there was a rabbinic concept of righteousness, debits, and credits, which a banker would understand and a bookkeeper would understand well. Here's a balance scale. And the idea was by performing good mitzvot, good works of Torah, you could uh, make up for and balance the scales and make up for the bad works that you do. And that's why people want to sac sacrifice little birds and things like this, the blood of birds and the blood of different kinds of animals at the temple to absolve themselves of their sins, and it was considered to be a good work because you donated money and the priest got money, and it's sort of like a Hindu temple, you know. But the idea that you buy your way out of your bad behavior was, was something that Yeshua did not like at all. And he had some very interesting things to say about it. Uh, this idea of earning credits against your debits by doing the optional mitzvot of Torah to make up for all your all your sins, as you could finally balance it out and make yourself righteous in the eyes of God. Uh, and there were extreme Pharisaic acts of piety, as I said, like straining soup, and that would earn righteousness. And Paul Paul extended the idea of Yeshua that this was no, this is not right. He called these things works of the law, works of Torah versus faith, but faith without works is dead. But that's not the kind of works that Yeshua talks about. He's not talking about works of mitzvot, works of law, works of Torah. The definition of sin is its debt, its karma that's owed to people or other living beings by those who commit injustices against them. That's the basic, that is the basic sin in life is to commit injustice against living souls. Sin against them is sin against God. Now, Yeshua's parable of the sheep and goats, uh, inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Uh, and inasmuch as you have not done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it unto me. Everything you do in life, you are doing as unto God. And the way you treat your fellow man <coughs> is how you treat the Christ is how you treat God. And so this is the, the core to the understanding of the Messianic idea 
of what sin is. Now, Yeshua says you have to make peace, you have to make shalom, you have to make it right as well as you can with all you've wronged before God will accept your offerings. And your offerings are your meditations, your prayers, and things like that. To the best of your ability, you have to do, you have to make it right, you have to harmonize yourself, tune yourself up. And injustice is the clip out of the crown sphere of life. It's the, it's the bad yetzer of life, and it's the primal generator of all the others, and it's also the primal root of all sin. So if you want to talk about what the root of, quote, sin is, greed may be the, uh, greed for money may be the root of all evil, but injustice, and, and especially uh, injustice uh, done consciously is the root of sin. So Yeshua taught that spiritual debt was owed to God. It's just like a child's debt to his parents for giving him birth and generating him and raising him and so on. But it's enormously <coughs> greater than that because uh, it, it's, it's a much more a greater debt. It's not a debt that you can pay off by balancing the scale, by sacrificing birds and doing optional works of, of, of Jewish Torah. It's too large to repay. You can't repay it. You cannot uh, repay what you owe God. You couldn't even repay what you owe your parents, although you do owe them things when they get old and can't take care of themselves. Uh, for example, uh, when Yeshua talks about the woman caught in adultery, he points out that none of them are without sin. Paul says all have sin. No one is without sin. We all have this. And this particular thing, if we understand it as debt, is a debt that we have that we owe, so to speak, to God. We owe to life. As a child owes a parent, not because we've committed injustices against God, but because we owe our life to God. We owe everything. So he tells a very interesting parable of the debtor servant. And in this parable, uh, a a wealthy person has a, a servant who he has loaned huge amounts of money, so much money the servant can never repay him. Like it would be like billions of dollars. Now, whenever you have a debtor, you can drag them into court and demand to be paid or else they get put into jail. And that was a very common situation, debtor's prison in the time of Yeshua, especially with the Romans. And so in his parable, he says, this man is dragged into court and before the judge and the fellow that he owes the money says, this guy owes me a billion dollars. And the judge says, pay up. He says, I don't have it. And, he, and the guy says, well, I'm going to have to throw you into prison until you pay the last penny. And then the guy says, have mercy on me. And then the guy that he owes all the money says, okay, I'll release you from this debt, from the consequences of paying this debt at this time. And the guy goes out in the street. The first thing he does is he runs into somebody who owes him money. He grabs the guy and turns him upside and pull, pours everything out of his pockets and takes everything from him. Has no mercy on him. And some of the, some of the guards of the judge see this happening. But they go back and tell the people and they say, oh, go get him. Bring him back. They bring him back. And he said, okay, uh, we're throwing you into prison. Bang, there you go. Because you had no mercy. You had mer we had mercy on you. You had no mercy on him. Okay, well, the reason he tells this parable is because there's several things. Number one, the, the debt that we owe to God, so to speak, is something we can't, we can't get out of. We're still the children. We still owe everything to our parents, uh, no matter how, what kind of parents they were, but assuming we have a perfect and good parent. And that debt is not, is not released. When, it's, when you say the debt is forgiven, it means the consequences of the debt are forgiven. You don't have to repay it. But the debt doesn't go away. Otherwise, they couldn't have called the guy back into the courtroom and said, okay, we're gonna, we've changed our mind. You have to pay it now. Because the debt is still there. So when you forgive a debt, when you forgive a sin, you don't stop the consequences of it from happening, but you can refuse not to, not to not to collect on the consequences. And I, I want to make that point very clear because uh, 
the idea of forgiveness of sins doesn't mean, I asked Mother Jenny once, I said, is forgiving the same as forgetting? And she said, absolutely not, because it's still there. But when you forgive, that means you simply release the person from the obligations that that, that, that sin against you or that trespass against you or that debt implies. But technically, you could call it up again, so to speak. You could decide not to forgive the person, and people do that in their lives a lot, especially ex-wives and things like that. You know. uh, but uh, Daniel's laughing. Uh, anyway, uh, so the release is from the bad consequences of the sin, but the debt still remains, and that's a very important understanding. It doesn't. It isn't destroyed and just dis disappear. So when you go to the priest and he says, oh, my son, your sins are forgiven, uh, say five Hail Marys, uh, that doesn't mean that the, con that the fact that you went out and caused a whole lot of damage to other people uh, doesn't have its consequences. We all still have to live with the mess you made, but uh, you have to now go out and try to make it as right as you can. It's not something you can walk away from. So... Um, God releases or forgives debtor from the bad consequences of sin if the debtor forgives those who sin against him personally. Forgiveness of sins is conditional, not absolute, and it depends upon you passing on the same grace to others. And that's this whole thing about forgive us just as or in the same measure as we forgive those who sin against us. When we say forgive us our... Uh, our, uh, our debts or our trespasses as we forgive those who sin or trespass against us. That is a, an oath, that's an obligation saying we're going to do that and we, that's a contract, we will abide by it. And when you do that, that's how liberation takes place. Just you getting liberated isn't the thing. You're liberated so you can liberate others and hopefully so they can liberate others. And that's why eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth doesn't work. The old ex talionis results in, uh, and just it goes on and on and on through generations and families. So this complex web of karma can be loosened or can be remained tight. And it can play out the easy way or the hard way. The way of God makes the burden light. Yeshua says, my burden is light. And so Now, the name Yeshua means liberation through release from spiritual bondage. Yeshua is from this root, Y-S-H-A, which, as I said, means escape from a narrow and confining place into a wide and pleasant place. In Hebrew, a narrow terrain is a dangerous place you could be ambushed, and a wide terrain is a place that could, you could see the enemy's coming it was safe, and so on. Uh, Matthew 122 says, You shall call his name Yeshua because he will liberate his people from their sins. And that is a very good explanation of what the mission was. His, his work was the work of liberation. And it was liberation from bondage to evil. Liberation in the Messianic age, he begins his ministry by reading from Isaiah 58 in the synagogue. And he says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? Not, not a fast where you give up food and you uh, put ashes on your head and rip your clothes off and everything. Here's the fast I have chosen. To, chew, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that thou might bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou do that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shalt thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. And that's what he reads. That's the way his mission begins. That's what he is doing. And it is a fast that he's doing, because he probably became a Nazarite. He probably took the vow of a Nazarite. He will not cut his hair until this is done. In fact, he even says in one of the Last Supper things, he says, I will not drink of the vine again until I see you again in the kingdom of heaven or something like that. This is a Nazarite kind of vow. 
But his, this is the fast that he has chosen to liberate people. And it starts out with exorcism. But whether his name was given at birth or whether it was self-designated or he was received it from John the Baptist or whatever, the liberation he offered was not political freedom from Rome. Uh, he, in fact, said uh, when he was asked if people should pay the taxes to Caesar and so on, and he was trying to be trapped by some people because they say, well, if he says pay the taxes, then he's a collaborator. If he says don't pay the taxes, then he's a zealot. He'll be in trouble. And then he held up the coin and he looked at this picture of Caesar on the coin. He said, whose picture is this? And he said, that's Caesar. And he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Man and money is Caesar's. Give him for you. Give it to him. And unto God the things that are God's. So... James and John said, Master, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume his enemies, even as Elias did, because Elijah uh, uh, brought fire down from heaven to burn up all the priests of Baal and the legend and so on. But Yeshua turned and rebuked him and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Bar Enosh, the Son of Man, is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So, uh, they ask if they could have permission to do this, to call down fire from heaven to, to destroy his enemies. That was not asking if he had power to do it. They said, can we have permission to do this? They knew they could. They never did. They never did anything like that. They never retaliated. None of them. In fact, Peter... Uh, um, felt so unworthy that when he was time came that he was crucified in the Neronian persecution where thousands of Jews were crucified along the, the long roads and lit on fire to, to, uh, to serve as light for the uh, Roman parties and things he wanted to be crucified upside down because he felt not worthy <clears throat> so it was spiritual liberation not, not physical liberation from the from the prince of this olam, from the self-created consequences of sin and the existential condition that we perceive of God's absence. God is not absent, but we perceive God. We live as though God were absent because we can't see God, we can't see justice, we can't see anything, say things happen. It's up to us to, to manifest them as the hands and fingers of God. So. This is what we call, in John's Gospel, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That is what Yeshua came to liberate people from. The world meaning worldliness, the attachments to the things that we see with our eyes of flesh. The flesh, the appetites, the things that Buddhism teaches us to become free from. And the devil is just the evil of our own <coughs> Paul says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Uh, because he understood that this was what it was all about. Uh, there was no longer fear, existential fear of death or of the grave or any of this sort of thing.
Now, the science of forgiveness is called shalak, and it means non-retaliation. Shalak itself means release. It's translated as to forgive. To forgive someone who sins or offends or committed justices against you means to release him from the consequences that inevitably will rebound upon him. <coughs> if, you, if someone does real bad things to you and you don't do anything bad to retaliate, they're going to have consequences that are going to come back upon them. And what goes around comes around. When you forgive, you forgive them from those consequences except whatever they will pull upon themselves that you can. In other words, there's nothing in you that will cause harm to that person or to wish harm for that person or to want it to come back on him and rebound upon him. There is nothing at all. It's non-retaliation, sincerely from the heart. Now, the person who intentionally harms another person creates an injustice. And that sets up a destructive existential imbalance in nature that is beyond his control to amend. You just can't change it once you do that. It's like once the arrow is out of the sling, it's gone. You have no control over it. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Newton's third law, like a bullet shot at a wall that ricochets back to the shooter with the same force as the shooter fought it, shot, shot it out, that will come back to people who commit injustices. And that's karmic rebound. It just will happen. But you don't want to make it happen to them. You just know it will. Uh, there's an ancient philosophy of justice called the law of retaliation, lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Uh, this is justice without mercy. Mother Jenny used to say, when we exact an eye for an eye, pretty soon we'll all end up blind. The question is, where does the cycle begin and how do we stop it? He had it coming because such and such. This, is, this goes on in the Middle East. This is not part of the teaching of Muhammad, but it's part of the customs of, of Islamic tribes and people. And they do all kinds of horrible things, like murder their sisters because they think they may have dishonored the family or something. And they have to, they have to take revenge on so-and-so because so-and-so took revenge on them. I think Mark Twain does a wonderful story about people up in the hills of Oklahoma or someplace and, and, the, and, and the, the, the battles that went on through generations of killing each other back and forth, three generations of people that are ambushing each other and killing each other. And this goes on and on and on. Well, he did that. Well, you, his children are like that. He hit me first, you know. All that. Where does it stop? Somebody has to take the bullet. Somebody has to take it and stop it. And that's what is being talked about with non-retaliation. It's not easy. It's not for the faint-hearted. This argues against the you know, justice system. No, God right. provides justice, not you. Right, I'm saying the, the whole system, courts and laws, and if you murder someone and you get sent to prison, it sounds like that's arguing against that. Yet you no. have to ensure no. the safe society. No, it doesn't. He says, Yeshua says, if you do this thing, you'll get put in jail and you have to pay the last penny. This is the human system of courts, and that, that obtains. But that's not for you to do, to take it into your own hands and go out and shoot somebody and commit that act of what you think is justice. That's something that a greater body has to deliberate on. It has to be out of your hands. It's not in your hands to do. You have to leave it up to God, so to speak, and that God might act through the justice system and you might not. You know, there are all kinds of complications. But the victim is the only one who has a spiritual power to end a cycle of retaliation. And so if the victim thinks, well, I'm going to do justice, this will settle this once and for all. I'm going to assassinate Abraham Lincoln and then everything will be okay. It doesn't work. Yeah. There was, in those little books in the room, it's kind of like the Buddhist version of the Gideon Bible. Mm -hmm. It's in our rooms. <clears throat> I happen to be reading it. And it's where that particular author is out giving talks and he's got questions back and forth. And they're taking an extreme case where they're asking this llama, well, what do you do if like somebody's threatening your life? And he says, well, then I'll have to do something to avoid them taking it. Yeah. And the person's pressing him. He says, what if it's him or you? What if it's you have to kill him or he is going to kill you? And of course, you know, this is really pushing the issue. He says, 
Well, the Lama says, well, in that case, it's better that he kills me. Yeah, that's correct. Because the act, if you kill somebody, and of course that's, you know, I mean, here they don't even want to kill a bug. But that puts so much hook back on you, first of all, and next of all, it doesn't do anything to the person you kill. You know, yeah. killing them does not, it doesn't do anything to fix what's wrong with them. Plus, it pulls all that guilt and all that hood back on you. Yeah. So it just makes, in, from a, a cosmic or whatever point of view, it just makes the problem worse. Yeah, there's a very big difference. There's no such thing as it's him or you. It's it's you can still defend yourself without killing a person aggressively. No, but in this in this particular question, he's pressing the point mm -hmm. that he did say, you know, that they're to look for some other thing to do. Yeah. But okay. He's got question, he's got a gun on me. I've got a gun on him. I can blow his kneecap off. No, but in this particular no. question, the the the. the the questioner was pressing the llama that it's either the attacker dies or the llama dies. That was the point of the yeah. question. You can read it if you don't yeah. believe it. No, no, I, I do believe you. I know that this is a Buddhist tenet. Okay, and the llama says it's better that I die than for me to kill the attacker. That's right. And that is, and, and the lots of Tibetan Buddhists do that and a lot of other Buddhists do that. And some of them even set themselves on fire and do all kinds of things like that. Uh, we're not, let's distinguish between the teachings of Yeshua. If Jesus was, uh, was a Christer, <laughs> if he was the kind of guy who was going to say, if it's him or me, then it's going to be me, and people took up stones to stone him, would he have parted the people and walked away? No, he stood there saying, hey, kill me, kill me, kill me. No. And that is a different kind of thing. Shalak. The science of non-retaliation is very different than killing them before they kill you. Because killing them before you kill, get, they kill you gets to be George Bush's preemptive war. <laughs> is that understood? There are more options just because you don't know what they are. You have to defend yourself. You have to defend your loved ones. That's very good. But the victim is still the only one who has the spiritual power to end the cycle of retaliation. And I'm, this is, this is going to go a lot further, and I want you to be patient while I take you through this, because this is very important to understand. This is one of the really heavy teachings. Uh, the prosecutor, Shaitan, asks, what shall be the punishment and how shall it be rendered? And if the victim says, get thee behind me, Satan, there shall be absolutely no retaliation from me then the evil one has no authority to carry it out. But usually the victim's heart cries out for vengeance. His blood cries out from the ground. The blood of uh, Abel cried out from the ground to, uh, to God, the injustice of the blood. And that's how God picked up the fact that he'd been murdered, this kind of stuff, you know, this sort of thing. Now, uh, if, if something really evil happens, then Shaitan says, how will we do this punishment? Would you like me to do this to him? Would you like me to do that to him? And if you say, get thee behind me, Satan, if you say, no, no, we're not going to retaliate in any kind of way. What did Yeshua say to the people who crucified him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And course when you're up on the cross and you're all punched full of holes it's probably a little easier to say that because there's nothing else else you can do I guess but that is the that's the idea of non-retaliation non-retaliation now that's he's not in a position to defend himself he's not in a position to defend anyone else's being hurt he's in a position where he is going to die very quickly and so he releases the people who are killing him and that, I think, is really what the Buddhist means when he says it's better that he kills me than I kill him. Yeah. I think the, the thing that we're getting caught up in is the illusion of death. Because the part of us that's important isn't going to die anyway. It's just when the body dies, it's okay, game over until we come back and play a new one. Yeah. You know, it's really no more significant than a video game. That we're learned, or a, World War II. Yeah. Let me, no. let me go on with this before we have all kinds of disputes. Uh, if the victim sincerely prays to God, forgive them, Father, Mother, for they know not what they do, then Satan cannot act. And the cycle of karmic retaliation is put on hold, maybe even permanently. 
So I'm telling you, that's what the dynamic of the spiritual science, the science of the victim deciding to end the cycle of retaliation, which they perceive as justice. Now, the good Yetzer, the good impulse of the Sephira of the Hayim HaOlam, of the life, motivates only to benefit and liberate life. As Yeshua said, you do not know what spirit you are dealing with. Because we come here not to destroy men, but to save them. The Baranash has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. The Son of Man is here to do that. By releasing an enemy from the natural consequences of his injustice against you, and that you're the only one who can, you can't release him from the injustice against someone else. Two people are liberated, you and the enemy, and that was what you were pointing out on the side of the Lama. Yashua says, in the same measure that you give, you shall receive, in the same measure you forgive, you shall be forgiven. And the two statements that say the same thing. In whatever measure you give, it you shall receive, pressed down, flowing over in full measure. And in the same measure you forgive, you shall be forgiven. Now let's, let's take this a little further so we can understand this. How to practice this without, like, ending up being all bloody, okay? It's a halakhic imperative from Yeshua. He says, members of the new humanity must forgive. It's a sign of the new humanity. It's a sign of the Son of Man, the Baranash. Release us from our debts at four because in the measure that we release those who sin against us. How do you do that? How do you do that from your heart? First, you have to try to understand the offender's point of view and pressures and weaknesses and negative influences and the ignorance of your point of view. And let me say that all these statements about turning the other cheek are all about your brother when your brother does this to you. They're all about when your family members, when your church members, when your community, not when the invaders from the north come with spears to wipe you out. In my novel, Jesus kills somebody. In my novel, he defends people. In my novel, he beats the hell out of some people. Okay? I did that very specifically to, to separate this science of forgiveness from the people who thinks that means you can't defend yourself and you can't defend others. Uh, so please understand that. Let me take you a little further into this. How you release your enemies. Very often your enemies are your brother. In all the statements he talks about turning the other cheek, he says, when your brother does this, so you have to understand there's different levels of this. First, you have to really understand what the other person, let's talk about your enemy. Let's say my enemy is Tofa. She's done a real nasty thing to me and she sent out an email and told everybody that uh, and I do this or something like that, you know, and whatever, you know, this kind of stuff. How do I deal with that? That's the kind of enemy we're talking about. That's satanic. That's where you're betrayed by your wife or your friend or someone like that. We're not talking about the Nazis come breaking into your home and holding a gun on you. Why so let me break Pardon? That, where, please don't get into these things. I want to take you someplace right now. So you have to understand, I have to understand what Tofa's motives are, why she did what she did, what pressures more on her, etc. That's the first thing you need to do. Love your enemies means to, means to have compassion on them. The word love is chesed. It doesn't mean you have to like them. You don't have to even think they're good looking or you don't have to think they're nice people or anything. To love means that you deal fairly with them and faithfully and honorably and you don't badmouth them. That's what chesed is. That's what love is. Love is not a gushy little feeling in your heart. Love is treating people with justice and fairness. That's what the word is. Chesed. And that's what it means in Hebrew. So that's compassion and understanding of people. And real forgiveness can only be, be, be based on your own sincere compassion. It's called bodhicitta. It's what people nourish in Buddhism. It's the good yates are in the heart. Compassion and understanding, it's a sacrificial offering from the heart. It's not just an external ritual or hollow words. And we do know, psychologists will tell us, forgiveness is not something we do for other people. We do it for ourselves to get well and move on. Because you poison yourself. With, with resentment and negativity and all this sort of thing. And, and, and really learning how to get rid of it, how to pluck it out, is a very important uh, thing for yourself and your own soul as well. 
Now, personal enemies versus mortal enemies is what we've been talking about here. And this is a confusion, and this is why it's not fair to ask the Lama, what if, what if it's him or you, and all this kind of stuff. They, we're, we're not talking about that. Uh, family, colleague, neighbors, brothers, friends, whoever strikes you on the right cheek, offer in the left cheek, do not strike back in kind. These are all things that are said, when your brother does this, do that. When your brother does this, do that. We're talking about when I'm betrayed by someone that I care about or someone who's supposed to be my friend or something like that. And forgiveness, this is a very nasty one. It's like the ocean when the lava flows into it and it quenches the fire of judgment which burns within our souls. We do, when we, when we take that that fire, which is the anger that wants to kill and destroy and harm other people in retaliation, when we quench that, we can see clearly to see how we should act and how we have to. Sometimes we have to take a very strong action. If you have a child who's been very bad, you might have to spank his bottom, even if it's illegal in your country to do that. Uh, and uh, you may have to take an action to correct. Even a, a mother lioness cuffs her child away when she when when he's being a pest, you know. You, you do have to uh, sometimes exert some strong discipline over children or other people, and you have to be willing to pick up your sword and do it without being mean. So this thing of offering him the left cheek also when he strikes you on the right cheek doesn't mean when the Nazi comes in and tries to rape your wife and blow your family away, he says you don't offer him your dog as well, you know. That's not what that means. It means when uh, your, your business partner does nasty stuff to him, you treat him still with uh, respect and with all this kind of stuff. You'll get better results that way, by the way, with everything. How many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said to him, I sin not to thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. In other words, that just is another way of saying you always do that. That's the way you do it. You but don't. That's 491st time. No, no. Well, that's just hyperbole. It's just another way of saying that. you always do. It. And when we deal with mortal enemies, we have a little different situation. Um, and probably the only place that there's anything we can find in the New Testament that deals with mortal enemies, because this is Yeshua was not asked about things like that. He was to ask about how you relationships in the community, and so on. But in Romans, Paul says, If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If they thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, that's a forgiveness strategy. How would, how would President Bush apply this? Uh, here we've had these, these real extremists who are trying to take the hearts and minds of Islam and Islamic people to a certain place. If, if Bush is going to do well and has a foreign policy where he listens to and addresses the issues that have allowed that kind of extremism to come to have any power at all, that's how you address that. Instead of going after to get those guys and show them what they should be done, he should be dealing with why this happened. They're just like bees when you stir up a hornet's nest. Instead of going out and stirring up the nest more and more, you go out and you figure out how do you make the bees happy? What do you have to do? And that is not a, a chicken way to do things. That's a more intelligent way. Paul's forgiveness strategy are the coals that you heap on people's heads are more than shame because true forgiveness sends a psychic attack directly upon an attacker. And if you have someone who is out to really get you and doing harm to you in a very negative way, even by forgiving, by simply defending yourself. That's all you have to do is defend. So you're not sending out. That means you're not retaliating, but you can defend very effectively. Then what happens is whatever that person sends against you comes back and whacks him, and you have no control over that. You didn't send it out. So that should not be your intention. If it make it your intention, then you're sending it out. But if you just defend, if you just defend, then that's what you do. That's what our, our army was supposed to be. Our military is supposed to defend us from people, not to invade people. That's what the American army was for, to defend us from aggressors. And an, a war of defense is ultimately an in, and, and eminently uh, defensible 
uh, theologically or any other way you want. But a war of aggression is a whole different bit in this whole idea of, of uh, that, uh, that's come up by the neocons that have come up with this idea of uh, preemptive strikes and things like this is, a, is not a good strategy that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, in talking about that, like some of the Palestinian terrorists have said, you know, we're not going to be happy until Israel's wiped off the right. face of the earth. So if the only thing that's going to make them happy is exterminating every Jew on the planet, obviously you can't concede to that. So what no. can you do except kill them? No, you defend yourself from them. Kill themselves. Defending yourself from them is very different than going out and aggressively trying to kill them. So if you if you spend your time figuring out how to deal with that situation that way, rather than sending out spies and putting sending out bombs in villages that kill a whole lot of innocent people and make more things worse and worse and worse, that's different than if you go out and try to kill them and oops, kill the wrong guy and oh kill his daughter as well and all this kind of stuff. This is, this is what's going on. The Israelis are just as guilty as anyone of this retaliation thing. The Israeli philosophy was uh, nine, nine of the enemy for every Israeli or something like that. And that was how they handled it. They thought, yeah, nobody will dare do it when they're wrong. They just make, make it worse. It stirs up the hornet's nest. So bad strategy. They need to deal with the, the basic issues that brought these conflicts in the first place. And, and that's the way this will be solved eventually. It's, it will be solved that way, and it will be one day when we get people who are not morons that are doing this, but you can't just do retaliation. Retaliation will never make it better if you keep picking at it and it'll never heal. You know, it's one of those things. Anyway, let's go on just a little bit here. Uh, when his own villagers tried to stone him to death, Yeshua merely parted the crowd and walked away. He defended himself, and he prayed for forgiveness for those who ex executed him. So I'm telling you, forgiveness is not for the faint of heart. It is not something that's easy to do, but retaliation is not the best way. It's not a good strategy, and it just makes things worse. So that is not the way to handle this kind of stuff. Now, uh, it's time for dinner, and I have just a couple more slides, so do you want me to do them now, or do you want me to... Get it done. Yeah, yeah, it done. You have okay. both you have one, one. You have one slide here, and then I think... Uh, those, we don't have to do those, though. So. Then there's... Okay, well, we then have this to do is the those. last one. So okay, next good. One so let's talk about Atsa, treasure versus mammon. Heavenly treasure versus worldly treasure. This is a very important part <coughs> of Malachi. Mammon <coughs> is an Aramaic word that means riches. It's probably from the Mishnaic Hebrew uh, Mammon and, and personifies maybe the Ammonite god Ammon, but Yeshua refers to it as a deity of worship, and he means by it worshiping materialism, wealth, gain, uh, self, and personal stuff. Yeshua says you cannot serve both God and Mammon. You can't do both. You can't serve God if you're going to be serving your self-interest all the time with what you perceive as self-enrichment, self-accumulation, self-attachment. So here's a, here's a painting woman made of the a person worshiping the god Mammon. Uh, and here's another picture I have of, of a person worshiping God. So that's uh, what I put those pictures up for because I couldn't find anything better on the internet. But anyway, uh, Heavenly treasure, or atzad. Uh, atzad are things of value that are stored or hoarded, like gold and jewelry and grain and money and things. Uh, and Yeshua advises you to lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where they're incorruptible and thieves don't break through. Now, atzad is the word that is used in connection with the heart, with the nectars that are stored in the heart that are that transmitted uh, after death, they still exist, and they are your friends, and they're like your good works and so on. This is what heavenly treasure is. Uh, it means good works of compassion. Compassion is the opposite of injustice. Uh, very often, you do what you think is just by retaliating, and you're doing something that's not just. You're doing something that's unjust. And 
Uh, on the other hand, when you show mercy, compassion, when you err on the side of mercy or compassion, very often you are not even erring as far as you should on the other side, and you're not erring at all. It means good works of <coughs> compassion. It's for the benefit of others while on earth that you can only do this. And it's a, as opposed to simply works of Torah, which are liturgical or which are ritual. Concerning, concerning non-attachment to worldly wealth, Yeshua said, if you want to become shalem, then go and sell your possessions, he said to the rich man, and give the money to the poor. And if you do this, you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow my halakha. In other words, he will become tongue. He will become perfect if he does that. And then he can follow the halakha. And the young man was not happy because he didn't want to have to do that. Uh, he said, it's easier for a fully loaded pack camel to go through the eye of the needle. And the needle is a very narrow gateway into a city where the uh, commercial camels have to unload all their stuff so they can be taxed or something else before they can actually carry it through into the city and then be reloaded again. It's easier for a fully loaded pack camel to go through the eye of the needle uh, than for a rich man to enter the, the Malkuth, the kingdom of God. By a rich man, he's talking about a person who is an accumulator of things, who is an accumulator of power and wealth, things like that. So. Yeshua sees worldly wealth as a major, major impediment to spirituality. And uh, as we all know, it, it works that way an awful lot. The people who make the accumulation of wealth and power the focus of their lives are people who are making I and me the center and focus of my life. And it's an illusion. You can't take it with you. He said straight, restrict is the gate. Uh, and narrow is the path that leadeth unto the life of the alone, and there be few that find it. And that means that the, the gate is the, is the halakha that you follow, or the teaching you follow that brings you into the pardes, into the garden. It's, it's, it's straight doesn't mean straight like a straight and narrow. It means straight means like strenuous. It means difficult. So it's not easy. So if you're going to follow the Hakka and you're going to do it, it's not an easy, sweet little journey. It's strict and difficult. These are all not things that go along with accumulation of money and having wealth and power. Uh, I'm going to break right now, but there's actually some more stuff that we need to go through. And I'm not sure what you have in your books, but uh, we can, we can do it at seven o'clock. Yeah, we can do it later, I think. Yeah, we're going to do um, There's five more slides. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we have tea floor. We have a few more. Yeah. Why don't we just go have dinner and come back? Yeah.